Hey everybody, we've got some great people here today. We're going to do a, a classroom style on what? How to lose weight but stay lean and keep it off for a lifetime. It's about little changes in your lifestyle, not massive crazy diets like zero carbohydrates and you know a thousand calories a day and all that kind of stuff. And really, how to lose weight in a lifestyle fashion and how to build muscle is based upon just education. That's what we're gonna do for you today. We're gonna to try to keep it under 20 minutes and if we have to do another video again, we will. I've got Mike, Blake Sr., Blake Jr., and Erica here so that they keep me on an even keel. Anytime you guys don't get something or you have a question, just raise your hand or blurt out the question, okay? So, in nutrition, there's three what's called macronutrients. You have proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Now, some stuff may not make sense right away, but we'll try to make it sense with it at first. These three macronutrients all behave completely differently in your body. The one that causes diabetes today and has really created the epidemic in obesity is really centered around carbohydrates and more so sugar. And we'll explain that in a second, or during this presentation anyway. Then you have fats, and fats can be broken down into saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, uh, medium chain triglycerides, long chain triglycerides, but the things we're gonna focus on are healthy fats. There's fats that you actually need in your body, not only for brain function and heart function and everything else, but you actually need these fats in your body to lose weight. So when people go on low fat diets, they're actually inhibiting their fat loss, and you'll see why during this presentation. And then protein is the building block to building muscle. Here's the number one key that you should write down, Erica, and you guys should write down as well. This is one thing that people don't understand. One pound of muscle actually burns 100 calories a day. So when you go and build maybe five to 10 pounds of muscle a day using the seven minute, the super seven minute workout program, you're, so let's say you, you go and build 10 pounds of muscle times 100 calories because it's one pound of muscle per 100 calories a day. That's 1,000 calories a day you're gonna burn and that's the equivalent of doing an hour of treadmill every single day. So Grant behind the camera was saying, well, the key to losing weight is doing cardio. Yeah, if you want to do an hour of cardio every single day, that's great. But how about build a little bit of muscle just in seven minutes at a time and burn 1,000 calories all the time? Okay, so we're going to talk about that as well. So what we're going to talk about first is the biggest ec epidemic in the world, which is sugar, obesity, which also leads to diabetes. And with diabetes, we're going to talk to you a little bit about fiber. Okay? So, carbohydrates. First and foremost, one gram of carbohydrates has four calories in it. Okay? One gram of protein as well has four calories in it. Now this is why people thought fats made you fat. It's the most nutrient dense um, macronutrient you have. One gram of fat actually has nine calories. Okay, so it's, a fat has almost two and a half times more calories than a gram of protein or a gram of carbohydrates. But let me tell you this, none of these are created equal, okay? And we'll talk to you about that in a, in a little bit. Sugar, um, all carbohydrates, so you have what's called glycemic index. Okay, we're going to talk about carbohydrates for a while right now. And every carbohydrate, whoop, give me a sec. I guess I should have had a, an eraser here, but. Now, the higher, uh, uh, glycemic goes from 100 down to 10. The higher the glycemic index, okay, the faster a carbohydrate breaks down to sugar in your body and it's actually blood sugar that your body runs off of, okay? We have two sources of fuel. Our body can use fats or it can use carbohydrates. If there's a presence of both, it will prefer to use carbohydrates as the main source of fuel in the body before fats, okay? So, um, when you have a glycemic index of 100, that means it gets into the system, into your bloodstream very, very quickly. So table sugar has a glycemic index, so just pure sugar has a glycemic index of 100, and then your very complex carbohydrates like um, 
things like um, sweet potatoes or potatoes. Um, basically, the things that have the lowest glycemic index are things that grow out of the ground naturally. So things like brown rice, your vegetables, okay? Fruits, not so much, but brown rice, vegetables, potatoes, all those types of things have a very low glycemic index. The problem is sometimes when we cook too much of them, we actually break the food down and it increases the glycemic index a little bit, but that doesn't really matter so much. So here's what I want to talk to you about. Every carbohydrate breaks down to sugar and then it's sugar in our bloodstream that we utilize as a source of fuel in the body, okay? Every single one of them. How fast it breaks down is based upon your glycemic index, okay? So where diabetes has become a craze, I'm going to make a little chart for you guys here. And if this is blood sugar here, any questions so far, guys? Okay. So this is your blood sugar going this way, and this is time this way. And one more thing here, a hormone called insulin, okay? When you have diabetes, type 1 or type 2, one of two things happens. Um, either when you have type 2 diabetes, okay, your body becomes insulin resistant. Well, first, what is insulin? Insulin is the hormone that is released by the pancreas, the beta cells of your pancreas, which is located right around here in your body. And it's the pancreas that releases insulin in response to high blood sugar levels, okay? Or to, in response to blood sugar levels. So when you eat something that, say, has a high glycemic index, what happens is, in a very short time, your blood sugar spikes up quite high, okay? So let's say it peaks at this point. Your body then wants to take those high blood sugar levels and store that blood sugar either as glycogen in a muscle cell or as fat inside of a fat cell. The higher your blood sugar rate is, the higher the amount of insulin your body releases. The more insulin your body releases, okay, the more likelihood because of such a high spike in insulin that the blood sugar is going to be stored in a fat cell, okay? Very, very important there. What happens in diabetes, because we are such a sugar-laden um, and processed food, you know, society, and what do I mean by processed foods? Processed foods are pre-digested. So when you look at, at like white bread and all these types of things that are manufactured by man, um, they have a very high glycemic index. So all of us eat way too much of this stuff. So what happens over time is you have a high insulin release, your blood sugar drops. When your blood sugar drops too fast, that's one of the stimulus to feel hungry again. You feel hungry again, you go and eat more sugar, you go like this, you get a high release of insulin in the body to bring the blood sugar back down, and this is what happens all day long. Craving after craving after craving, and so what people say, they're, well, I'm just a carbohydrate junkie. I love my carbs, I love my sugars, I love my sweets, I love all those things, and the reality is, it's not that you're a carbohydrate junkie, you're just reacting to something that happens in the human body. The biggest stimulus for hunger is very low blood sugar levels, okay? So what happens here over time, two things can happen to create diabetes. One is what happens when you release the insulin is that sugar either gets stored in a fat cell or muscle cell, like I said, but what happens over time is it's kind of like a drug addict. If you're a drug addict and you're addicted to heroin, well, the first time you take heroin, you just need a little bit. Then the next time to get the same effect, you need a little bit more. You need a little bit more. In other words, your body becomes resistant to that drug. It's the same thing with insulin. When you keep releasing too much insulin all the time, the receptors on your muscle cell and your fat cell become resistant to the insulin stimulus. So what happens is, is your receptors on the muscle and fat cell become um, basically non-functional. They, they, they don't respond to the insulin. So what happens is, is your body goes into a loop and it has to release even more insulin to get the same response. Just like if you're a drug addict, you gotta take more of the heroin to get the same effect. Because your body's releasing so much insulin all the time, your beta cells of your pancreas actually go into a premature death, 
okay? They, they, they have a certain lifespan of how much insulin they can produce over a lifetime. Uh, Blake, can you just pass me like a white paper there? And I'll, I'll erase some of the stuff here. Thank you. And we'll just keep rolling, guys, because this is classroom style. So what happens then, and I'm just going to get rid of this for a sec, guys, is, like I said, the beta cells of the pancreas actually basically fatigue and they can die, and that's when type 1 diabetes occurs. So type 2 diabetes is what's called insulin resistance. In other words, the receptor cells of the muscle or the fat cell become resistant to it, and then you start taking things like metformin or glucophage. Glucophage is the little pill, so if anybody out there is on those little pills to get their blood sugar down, what it's doing is it's reacting with the muscle or the fat cell, but what you're doing is you're just masking the symptoms. Okay, what's eventually going to happen is your body's still releasing all types of insulin and eventually the beta cells of the pancreas die and guess what? Now you're type 1 diabetic, you can't produce insulin at all anymore and now you're on to injections, okay? That's the process that usually happens. Now there are some caveats to that, you know, there are juvenile diabetes, there is diabetes associated with genetic disorders and stuff like that, but I'm talking for 99% of the population. Now why is that important to people here? who are trying to lose weight or get in shape or whatever. Well, that's what we're going to talk about now, is what you want to do is really regulate your insulin levels as much as you can, and we're going to talk about how to do that. Here's what's really cool. Only carbohydrates create an insulin response, and insulin is the main hormone in the body the main hormone in the body, there's lots of them, but it's one of the key hormones in the body that cause you to gain fat. It's that simple. You regulate your insulin levels and you're going to regulate your, your fat levels. They're directly proportional. The higher insulin you have in your body, the more fat you're going to gain. The lower the insulin you have in your body, the more fat you're going to lose. Okay, that's what's really, really cool and it's really easy to do that. Here's what's really, here's the good news about all this because it sounds like bad news so far. Protein or fats do not affect insulin in any way, shape, or form. You don't need to get an insulin response to utilize fat as a source of fuel, or you need, you need a little bit of insulin to build muscle, but anyway, we're going to talk about regulation of that right now. So here's where the craze came. People, you know, like the Atkins diet, which is basically zero carbohydrates, they said, well, if you get rid of your insulin completely, and get rid of your pr primary source of fuel, which is carbohydrates, and just eat protein or fat, then you become a fat-burning machine, which is true, but the rebound is astronomical. Remember, we talked about doing things in our daily activities that we can maintain for a lifetime. People cannot abstain from carbohydrates forever. It's just not possible, okay, because so many of our foods have carbohydrates in it. How many people here can stick to cheese or meat or butter or things like that for the rest of their lives. They can't, it's not sustainable. So a lot of people who do the Atkins diet, which is completely remove carbohydrates, yeah, they lose a, a ton of weight, but then they go back to more normal eating and because they've abstained from carbohydrates for so long, they crave them like crazy, they get a huge rebound effect and they're back and even sometimes higher than their weight that they had before, okay? So here's the key. People started to think that carbohydrates are bad. Carbohydrates are not bad. Too many carbohydrates are bad, okay? So what I mean by that is you need to fuel your gas tank in your car to be able to drive the car. The minute you try to put more gas than the size of the gas tank itself, it starts to spill over, right? Well, it's the same equivalent with carbohydrates. You need a certain amount of carbohydrates in your day to feel good, to have energy, to have good mental function, all that kind of stuff. But the minute you eat too much, it spills over and stores as fat or glycogen in the muscle, primarily fat most of the time. So you guys are gonna to wanna to write this down. Usually about two grams, you wanna to stick to about 1.5 to two grams of carbohydrates per pound of lean body mass. That means what you weigh um, without your fat on you. So uh, your typical female, lean body mass, they're going to be about 120 pounds, okay? So a woman who's 120 pounds, 
they're going to want to stick to about 175 to 250 grams of carbs a day. Now you might want to be saying to yourself, how in the heck do I know how much I'm eating? Well, we'll do that on another um, blog because we'll teach you how to count your calories. And you don't really need to count your calories over time. You just come to know, like, for example, I know that two slices of bread are about 30 grams of carbs, okay? You're going to come to know that one potato, one potato is about 25 grams of carbs, all that kind of stuff. That's, that stuff is easy. Now, here's the other thing that's really, really, really quite cool and interesting in, so that's the first way you kind of control your insulin is by eating enough carbs in your diet that you utilize them rather than store them as fat, okay? Here's the other thing, that, and remember we, were, we said we we're going to talk about fiber. This is the coolest trick in the book that I've seen people lose almost 100 pounds on. Remember, we're talking about easy, sustainable things that people can do. Well, glycemic index is a scientific formula, but there's other factors involved, okay? When you eat protein, carbohydrates, and fats together, well, if you're eating, let's say, a chicken breast, a potato, at the same time, well, when you're chewing that in your mouth and that's going into your stomach, they're going to mix together. Obviously, you're not going to have your stomach separate the carbohydrates over here and the chicken over here, right? So when they mix together, here's what's cool about protein. Protein is about two and a half times harder to digest than carbs, okay? So when you mix, when you eat protein with your carbohydrates, you're automatically going to lower the glycemic index of the carb that you ate because it's mixing with the protein. It becomes harder to digest. The harder it is to digest something, the longer it takes to get into your bloodstream and affect your blood sugar. Does that make sense? Okay? So here's one of the easiest and sustainable things that you can do. Here's your typical American plate. Usually on that plate, we see a portion like this of carbs and a portion of like about like this with protein, right? This is protein, this is carbs, okay? And all you have to do is reverse it. Just keep eating what you're eating for now because it's little baby steps to reach, achieving your goals. Make sure your protein source is about two times than your carb source on your plate. So your carb source, and again, we'll get into this another thing, your carb source might be a rice or potato or oatmeal or whatever, and your protein source might be a lean steak, chicken, uh, fish, whatever. It's that simple. That's all you have to do, and you'll start to see your body change very, very quickly because what you're doing is you're dramatically lowering the glycemic index of this carbohydrate because you got two times the protein than you do a carbohydrate, and now your glycemic index is lower, taking longer to digest. The longer it takes to digest, the lower your blood sugar. The lower your blood sugar, the less your cravings are going up and down all day long, and the better that you're affecting your insulin levels. You know, they suggest eating a bowl of oatmeal in the morning as a good breakfast. Is mm -hmm. that, should you eat anything along with it? You should eat a protein source, yes. Okay, so you need more. I mean, oatmeal is very, very, very low glycemic. That's why they say it is. It's a good, sustainable energy source. It's very good, but eating a protein with it is just going to keep it going balanced even longer, you know? How much, um, you know how you can get the little pre-sized oatmeal packages that's more processed than the traditional? Well, again, just look at the total carb amount on it, you know what I mean? If you're trying to get to 6% body fat, that's a different story. If you're trying to be a Lance Armstrong, that's a different story. You know what I mean? But Are you filming again? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here's the, the really cool thing when we want to try to, uh, to uh, keep our insulin even better. Fiber. Fiber is, is so magical. Fiber is the magic. Well, protein is power. Builds muscle. Uh, and fiber is your friend. That's what I like to say. Yeah. In fact, it could be your friend, too. <laughs> What's that? Fat can be your friend, too. It can. It can. So, 
Here, here's the problem with, again, most of the things that you buy on a grocery store shelf are processed. What does process mean? It, it's, it's almost pre-digested. When you bake things and cook things and do all this kind of things, you're already breaking down the material again quite a bit. Like as an example, eating a raw potato, we can all agree, is going to be much harder to digest than a cooked potato. Eating raw vegetables is going to be much harder to digest than cooked vegetables, so on and so forth. You're already breaking it down. Um, and that's part of the problem here. And then if you go to the extreme, when you look at something like white bread, I mean, it takes such little energy for your body to digest it that that's why it has such a high glycemic index. When you look at table sugar, I mean, you don't even, your body doesn't even have to digest it. It's broken down into its simplest form that it goes into your stomach, into your large intestine, and into your bloodstream almost immediately. Okay, and that's, that's the problem. Here's, what's, here's, here's the, the caveat to this. Um, 100 years ago, we used to have, because our food wasn't so processed, we used to have a lot more fiber in our diets. We are made to have high fiber diets. The reality is with today's processed food, we just simply don't get enough fiber in our diets, okay? Fiber has all types of health benefits. It lowers your cholesterol, it lowers your blood sugars, it helps manage diabetes, it's great for weight management and weight loss, even though I can't say weight loss by FDA standards, but I'm just telling you that now, I know for a fact it will help you lose. Okay, I can't say fact either because I'm not a medical doctor, you know, all this kind of stuff. Don't want to get sued. But anyway, it has all types of benefits. And here's why. There's insoluble and soluble fibers, okay? There's two types. With our product that's coming to the marketplace, we have a very good combination of both. What does ins insoluble mean? It means it can't be digested by the human body. In other words, when you eat it, it just passes right through and comes out the other end. Soluble is very hard to digest, but is digestible by the human body, okay? But still extremely low, low, low glycemic. The other thing fiber does is it bulks. It's bulk forming. For two it suppresses the appetite for two reasons. Two things that cause appetite to either increase or decrease. What's in your stomach and what's in your bloodstream, okay? Low blood sugar levels, even if you have a full stomach, you're still gonna feel hungry. And vice versa, if your stomach's completely empty, but your blood sugar levels are adequate, you're still gonna feel hungry because your stomach's completely empty, okay? Here's what's really cool. You can help this whole insulin fat gain equation so much easier, all you have to do is take our fiber supplement twice a day. So, and then this is how it works, and this is why it works. Just like when you combine a protein with your carbohydrate, when you combine an insoluble fiber in your diet with your carbohydrate and your protein, because it's undigestible, okay, it cre again, when you eat all three, so if you eat your meal, then what we strongly recommend is just before your email, now, don't have fiber first thing in the morning. You want to eat your breakfast because that's the most important meal of the day. You can have fiber right after your breakfast. Then before lunch or dinner, you have your fiber before lunch or dinner. Okay, because here's why. Remember, when you eat everything, it all mixes into one. So now you come, you've had your fiber, now you start eating your meal. Well, one, it's going to bulk form right away, so you're not going to be able to eat as much. People who have adequate fiber in their diets have shown in studies to eat about 20% less calories naturally without even thinking about it, okay? Just because their appetite is suppressed. But when you have the fiber in your stomach already and you eat your carbohydrates and your proteins and your fats and everything else that you're eating, it all mixes into a bolus, okay, into your stomach. Again, it, your stomach doesn't separate them out. And then when it passes into your large intestine, your large intestine, after your stomach digests things, is where things pass through the intestinal wall into your bloodstream to be used as a source of fuel or as a building block for protein for building muscle. Here's what's cool. When it's insoluble, what that does is the insoluble fiber creates a barrier between your intestinal wall and your bloodstream. So now your protein, if this is your barrier, actually, let me, let, me, let me create a little something with that. I'll do that right here, okay? So if this is your intestinal wall, this is your bloodstream here. And by the way, foods 
can only be assimilated once or in your bloodstream or utilized as a source of, of fuel and building blocks. And if this is your large intestine on this side, okay, on this side, what the fiber does, you know, this is for illustrational purposes, but it's that, this kind of idea, it creates a barrier. Be why? Because it's insoluble. It actually sticks to your intestinal walls. Okay? It bulk forms and sticks to your intestinal walls. That's why fiber is also marketed as a laxative, okay? So now you've got your carbohydrates that have to move through this barrier before they hit the bloodstream. It takes much, much longer. So now you get a constant release and a much slower release of sugar into your bloodstream. Remember, the, the, when you have a, a more sustainable form of this, of blood sugar, constant blood sugar levels all day long, then this is what happens with that other thing, that, the other graph that we have. So again here, this is blood sugar, this is time, and this is insulin, right? I'll just put IN for now, okay? When you combine fiber, this is what you see. Remember before we saw something like this, right? This is what you see. Okay? Is because it takes longer to digest that sugar out of your stomach and out of your large intestine, you don't get huge spikes in blood sugar. Because you don't get huge spikes in blood sugar, you don't get huge spikes in insulin to counteract that. So when you don't get the huge insulin spikes, what happens is you, is you get a sustainable blood sugar all day long. When your blood sugar is stable all day long, you don't get cravings for sugar, you feel fuller, you have better energy. Remember, when your blood sugar is really high, you feel tired. When your blood sugar is really low, you feel tired. So that's why a lot of people feel tired all day long. They're doing this all day long. They're doing the caffeine and the sugar all day long, up and down, up and down, up and down. When you combine it with fiber, that changes to this other graph right here. Sustainable blood sugar all day long. So remember, a lot of people say, well, I'm just a carbohydrate addict. I just love my sweets. I love my sugars. No, you don't love them. It's a biochemical reaction that's happening in your body that's triggering your, triggering your brain to say that I love sugars and so on and so forth, okay? So um, let's pause there just for a sec, Grant, because I'm going to clean off this whole whiteboard. So basically, folks, you know, I'm kind of, you know, we're, we're on our kind of 20, 25 minutes for this one, is you will do another call to how to, you know, okay, well, what is this 170 grams of carbs? What is 170 grams of protein? I'm going to help out uh, Blake Jr. here. Um, a lot of people say, well, I want to build muscle. A lot, actually, a lot of people say, Joel, how do you stay so lean? Well, one, this is the truth. All I do is I take my dietary fiber twice a day and I limit the amount of carbohydrates that I eat just mentally. I don't write it down anymore. I just, I just know what I need to eat and what gives me good energy. But what I do also monitor is anybody who wants to build muscle, they want about two grams of, of protein per pound of body weight, of lean body weight, okay? Now this is going more into the exercise side, so I won't cover this too much, but here's the sad reality for those of you who are following the whole program, is it's really a combination of everything. You can exercise, but if you don't feed your body the right fuels, you're not going to build any muscle. Now, here's another misnomer. A lot of women out there go, well, I don't want to look huge. Here's the reality. You're in complete control of how you want your body to look. A bigger muscle is a stronger muscle. Let's say a woman gets to a certain arm size and she says, I don't want my arms to be any bigger or a certain thigh size. I don't want my thighs to be any bigger or any tighter. If you never increase the weight ever again, then you're going to stay at that exact level that you want to be. So ladies, you're in complete, utter, 150% control of how you want your body to look. And those fitness ladies out there that look amazing on the beach, they weight train, guaranteed, okay? Because remember, just in summary, um, one pound of muscle, okay, burns 100 calories a day. So typically, now this isn't for Blake, but typically after the age of 30, because our hormones change, primarily testosterone in both males and females, okay, goes down. 
This is why a lot of people gain weight after the age of about 30. Understand this. Testosterone levels go down in both males and females. Testosterone is the precursor to how much muscle mass you have. So typically after about the age of 30, you lose about two pounds to three pounds of muscle naturally, okay? So if you lose two pounds of muscle in a year to three pounds of muscle, let's go with the three pounds. Well, that's 300 calories a day that you're no longer burning, right? Because you don't have that muscle anymore. In one pound of fat, there's 3,500 calories, okay? When you take 3,500 calories and add that to here, right? Remember, this is 300 calories a day we're no longer burning, okay? So if you multiply that by seven, that's 2,100 calories a week, okay? Your me metabolism will adjust a bit, but this is exactly why people after the age of 30 typically gain 10 to 15 pounds of fat per year. And I'm glad I'm saying this because you probably can't understand my writing. That's the only reason people say, well, you know, when I was younger, I, I would look so lean and I didn't have to exercise and I didn't do anything and I look great. The difference is your diet stays about the same, but now you're losing two to three pounds of muscle every year. When you're losing three pounds of muscle, you're now burning 300 calories less per day. When you're burning 300 calories less per day, but still eating the same amount of calories, your body has no choice but to gain weight. And that's what happens. Here's what's cool when you do our whole program. You can easily reverse the effect of aging of these two to three pounds of muscle lost by just doing resistance training. So now you do the reverse. Let's say over five years you lost 10 pounds of muscle. That 10 pounds of muscle times 100 calories a day burned by that muscle. Now you might be saying, well, why does a pound of muscle burn calories? Well, when you look at fat, fat just sits there. It doesn't do anything. You can't contract it. You can't move it. When a muscle's bigger, a bigger muscular arm is going to take more calories to burn than a smaller muscle. And it's the same thing with the thighs and everywhere else in your body. Muscle is metabolically active. It contracts. So when you're contracting a bigger muscle than a smaller muscle, you're going to burn more calories. That's why 100 pounds, or sorry, one pound of muscle burns 100 calories a day, okay? And that's why, by the way, you see a lot of women doing the aerobics all day long and they never change. And then they get frustrated and then they quit. Why? Aerobics, yes, while you're doing the aerobic activity, you are burning calories, but you're not increasing your metabolism 24 hours a day. Why? You're not building muscle. So if you're doing the exercise during the exercise itself, you're burning calories, which is great. But wouldn't you rather build a little bit of muscle and actually be burning calories 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Again, that's why a lot of women who just do cardio exercise still have the chubby hips and the chubby thighs and, and they just get frustrated. They think, well, that, that's just me. I'm just a chubby person and there's nothing I can do about it. They just don't understand that if you go and build some muscle, you're gonna make all the differences in the world. So coming back to Blake who wants to build some muscle here, the one thing the body cannot do is it cannot manufacture protein. It can't, it just can't. It can break down carbohydrates and fats, and it can manufacture fats, but it cannot manufacture protein. So you can be weight training and creating the stimulus to build more muscle, but if the dietary protein needs are not there, the muscle can't synthesize and it can't grow and get bigger. So that's why it's a combination of both. You can work out, and you'll see some results for sure, but for the best results, when you get adequate amounts of protein with your training, I've seen guys gain 15, 20, 30 pounds in five, six months uh, very, very quickly when they get adequate protein into their diet. Um, but that's all I really wanted to cover for this. Is there's gotta be some questions. Come on, guys. Yeah, I want, um, what about fruit? What about what? Fruit. Fruit, fruit. Uh, it, it, uh, f again, a lot of people try to go to the extreme, right? Um, you're not looking to be like, you know, veins up your abs and all that kind of stuff. So fruit is fine. Again, carbohydrates are fine. Uh, to specifically answer, fruit is higher glycemic. But again, you're not trying to be the elite athlete of the world. So if you eat some fruit, that's fine. It, it's about doing things that are sustainable. If I said, oh, Erica, don't eat fruit at all, what's going to happen two weeks from now? You're going to crave fruit like crazy. 
So it's really more important for, for, your, for the average person trying to create a certain goal. It's not so much the type of carbs that they're eating, it's more the amounts that they are eating. So again, if you come back to that plate, typical American plate where this is usually this much carbs and this much protein, just reverse it, make this your protein and make this your carbs at every meal and you'll, you'll do much better. Good question. I have another one. Sure. Um, what would you say is the most important thing to remember for? Uh, the easiest, take your dietary fiber. That's the easiest. Because even if you don't do anything else perfectly, that's going to help you with your blood sugar levels unquestionably, and you're, you're going to start to lose weight. With the, the protein consumption, like mm -hmm. the two grams uh, per pound. Two grams uh, per pound. Yeah. Is there, the proteins that are out there, like the whey proteins and powders, is there any benefit to either like animal proteins like chicken breast or? Well, well, the, 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 the whey proteins that are the, out there, they're pre-digested, so they're easier to get into your system. That's a good thing because it doesn't affect insulin, so your, your body, it's more absorbable. But again, for your type of goals, um, and the other reality is, if you let's say you decided that ultimately you want to build a lot of muscle, one chicken breast is only about 30 grams of protein. So if you need two grams per pound of body weight, you're looking at about 350 grams of protein a day. That's 10 chicken breasts to 15 chicken breasts a day. You're just not going to eat that much, right? You're, you, realistically, you're just not, right? Yeah, that's why you have. That's why the protein powders are there, the protein bars, and all that kind of stuff. Is that um, with the use of fiber, will that affect the protein? Um, uh, uh, it, it can a little bit, but, but not significantly, because the, the fiber more affects your insulin levels, which we want to keep under control with carbohydrates. That's it? Okay, should I give you guys a test now? How many calories are in one gram of fat? Two. No. Four. No. Four. No. Four. no. What? Five. Oh, sorry. Nine. 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 Good. Nine. How many calories in a gram of protein? Four. Four. And carbohydrates? Four. Four. Okay. Good. Um, how many grams of carbs should you eat per pound of body weight? Two. Oh. One. <laughs> no. Two. It was two. Oh. So when you look at that, right? Um, you erased all my notes. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't talk too much about fats, but your fats want to come from things like fish, your omega-3, 3, 6, 9 are your main fats, and also a very good fat is coconut oil. It's one of the best out there in the world, and the reason is it, it has what's called MCT in it, which is, has all types of massive health benefits. But anyway, here's the type of ratios you want. The typical diet is this. If this is carbs, proteins, and fats, this is what you want to follow. This is your typical diet. You know, 20 to 30 percent here, anyway. And that's the problem. That's what, if you look at the difference, you want to have about 40 percent of your diet in carbohydrates, 40 percent in protein, 20 percent in fats. The typical American diet today is about 5 percent protein, 75 percent carbohydrates, and 20 to 30 percent fat. So it's all, again, carbs aren't bad. Too many carbs are bad, and that's what's wrong with today, is we're eating way too much sugar. So anyway, folks, if you have any questions, post them right here on the blog, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.